I want to share something. I was in presbyter meeting this week, and uh, the, our state evangelist got up and well, different the different departments that run different ministries in our in our North Texas district they, they bring a report. They do it spring and fall. And so early this week, we were I was down at the campground for a few days, and we had uh, the reports and everything. Well, our evangelist comes and gives a report, and he said something that bothered me. He said that he preaches all over the country, all around the world, really. And he said, when I go to the churches in America, not only does he preach, to, to preach but he also does training in evangelism. And when he, he goes to the congregation, he asks a question, how many of you or feel like that you're confident to share your faith with somebody who doesn't know the Lord. And he, he said, it's probably, my estimation, unscientific, but he said probably about 5% of every congregation I go to. And I don't know if it's that people are afraid they're going to call on him, so they're like, no, I'm not doing that. But that's an alarmingly low statistic for as long as most people have been in church. And it bothered me so much that I thought, I, I want to, and then I thought about our church. How many of us in our congregation this morning would feel confident, capable of sharing your faith and sharing the gospel with someone who does not know Jesus Christ? Well, we should, right? We should. Because the interesting thing about the lost is that prayer is not enough. You say, wait a second, Pastor, you talk about prayer constantly. No, it's prayer and going. We don't just say, Lord, just randomly by osmosis send folks in. No, we pray for the power and the presence and the equipping of the Holy Spirit. By the way, uh, they're teaching teaching on the Holy Spirit in the kids' class today. And I asked my wife, she said, oh, this is so good. We're teaching on the Holy Spirit. I just said, are you going to pray with those kids to receive the Holy Spirit? She said, you bet I am. So I'm praying. The Holy Ghost falls in there. But I'm praying we get the overflow. Come on, shout amen. But we have to go. And one of the things that we did, we, we hit about 100 homes with our door hangers. I want to begin every quarter at least to hit about 2,000 homes. We could do it. There's a way the Lord showed us how to do it with our teams. And we're going to be hitting about 2,000 homes a quarter. Why? Because of our, because of our, our gospel. So this morning, very quickly, I want to talk to us from the Word of God about sharing your faith. Because when, what I want is this. I want us that when we leave this place today, that you'll have a greater confidence that you, than you ever have before that you could share your faith. You can feel confident. You can feel capable, you can feel equipped that I can share Jesus with others and feel confident that I, that I am an effective witness for Jesus Christ. How many pastors do you have at you, in your church? I'm looking at all of them. We're all preachers. How many preachers? We're all preachers. So we're going to talk about this today. Here's an interesting thing, that evangelism is literally built in to the Christian faith. Now, what we're in today is the believers' meeting. And, but, but here's what I, I want you to hear, and I want to be careful with this, but, but I'll, I'll say it with a clean conscience, that Christianity is not just about going to private fellowship meetings with other believers to receive edification, to receive equipment, to give edification, etc., though, though that's a vital part of our walk with the Lord. In fact, we do less church today than we ever have in my, in my lifetime. I and mean, we used to, you know, they used to book two-week two week evangelistic meetings. They used to, you know, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, prayer meetings. People hardly missed anything. Dorothy Wilson for, for years told me, she said, I dragged every one of my kids to everything. And even and taught missionettes and came to prayer meetings and never missed a thing. And today, every little thing kind of knocks us off. So I won't, I'm going to leave that. But anyway, uh, but I just want to tell you that though the believer's meeting is vitally important, that's not the be-all and end-all of Christianity. And why is that? Because the church was never just that about that, but a vital part of Christianity is evangelism. It is reaching out to those who do not know and have never known Jesus Christ. And one of the things as we read our scriptures is that we'll see from the very inception and foundation of the New Testament church, evangelism was was built in. And from its very inception, they were going. They were always 
going somewhere. They were always going out. They were always reaching farther and further out to share the gospel with those who've never received Jesus Christ. Of course, Jesus gave the commission. And the great commission in Matthew says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit. And along with you always, even till the end of the age. And then Mark, Mark, Jesus said this in Mark. He said, go and go to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So this, this church of which we are part of is a going church. It's always been a going church. It's literally built into the very fabric. We see from the early writings of the book of Acts. What do we see? We see that the scattered church was a preaching church. We read in Acts chapter 8, it says this, Saul was contending to the, his death. That was Stephen. At that time, a great persecution arose, and it says the church at Jerusalem, and they were scattered. And guess what they did? It said they were scattered throughout the region of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. And then it goes down in verse 4 and says, Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere doing what? Preaching the words. Now notice, the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. So who were these people that were scattered out through all these regions beyond Jerusalem? It was people just like you and me. It was every single believer feeling the responsibility and knowing that they were capable to witness and tell people about the love of God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then as time goes along, Paul shows up. And God brings him in the church supernaturally by a supernatural encounter, and Ananias is told to go to him. And Paul, what Paul does is he, he begins to fan the flame of going. He begins to fan the flame. I mean, the church thought they were evangelistic before Paul showed up, but a little Paul fanned the flame. And I tell you, it really got going then as, as Gentiles begin to be brought in, as everyone was sharing their faith. It says this, Ananias says, The Lord says to Ananias, go, for he, Paul, is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. And then Paul, in writing the greatest thesis and the greatest word on salvation and what the death, burial, and resurrection means, the book of Romans, and he's quoting out of the Old Testament, and he he is encouraging the people to go, 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 and tell people in these words, Romans 10. Paul asks this very sobering question. It's very logical. He said, how then shall they call on him who they have not believed? How can anyone believe if they've never heard about Jesus? You ever notice how practical the Bible is? And how shall they believe in whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they be, say it with me, sent, say it, sent. And then he gives a blessing. This is a quotation out of Isaiah And it it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace and bring the glad tidings, the good tidings of the word of God. So even from Old Testament to New, the Lord through his apostles and ministers says, you are a blessed person. You're blessed by God. God blesses you and God sees that it's good as we go outside the church walls and we share Jesus with those who are in the darkness. We, we, we're in the light. We, listen, we've been to the great physician. And though we still need Jesus every day, there's those that have never been to the good physician, and they're sick, and they need him. And they need him out there, not just in here. So we see that evangelism is built into the very fabric of the New Testament. But here's the thing. We preachers say, go. I've said it several times, haven't I? We heard you, Pastor. Go, go, go. But here's the question. How do we go? Where do we go? When do we go? We're supposed to share. What do we have to share, Pastor? What are, what are the essentials of it all? Whom do we share with? When do we share it? These are the things I want to share in a very practical way. So let's, let's look at the first thing, and that's this. Why share our faith? Why don't we just... You know, I've enjoyed this service this morning. In fact, we were, we were laughing before the service even started. There was like a, a spirit of joy in here. I enjoy worshiping the Lord with God's people. 
Why go out there? Why share our faith? And it's very evident, and it's simply this. All who do not know Jesus Christ are lost. Everyone who is not in a saving relationship with Jesus Christ is cut off from God. They're living under that cloud of lostness. I don't know how your life was before you became a Christian. Everyone has different feelings and different experiences. But one of the, one of the gnawing feelings that I had was a feeling of emptiness. Just, just empty and nothing, nothing could ever fill that empty void. And I'd been to church. I'd been to church all my life. Been sprinkled in the Catholic church. Been catechized in the Catholic church, been the first communion. I was an altar boy. I was deeply involved in church, but I didn't know the head of the church, which was Jesus. And there was just emptiness that just hung over my life and, and was in, in that hollow place in my heart. Here's what I want us to see. Why should we share our faith? Because we must see people as they really are. We must see people as God sees them. I mean, you may know good old Joe or good old Tom or good old John, and he may be a good old boy, and he may be your buddy, and he may be jovial, and he may be a good employee that works with you and co-worker, but if he doesn't know Jesus, he's lost. We need to see him as God sees him. And the fact is, every human being is in need of God's saving grace. Now, I won't read all this, but in your own time, Romans 3 just lays it all out there. And you say, Pastor, what does he lay out there? Paul lays out in Romans, and he cuts us all down to the same size. Every one of us just tops us all down and says this, everyone is a sinner. You say, wait a second, I'm a king's kid. Well, I know that now. I know, But listen, we all have sinned. It says in verse 18 of Romans 3 that all the world may become guilty before God. We've all sinned, and we all at one time stood guilty before God. Every human being that does not know Jesus is lost. And we have to share our faith. Here's another thing, and that's this, simply, that Jesus loves every every person. And he has included them In his plan of salvation. This is the awesome thing about Christianity. No one is excluded. No one is beyond the love of God. No one is, listen, no one has been left out. And no one has any exclusive right to the gospel. Every human being has a right to God's mercy and God's love. Not that they have a right in a sense that they earn it, but because Jesus has made us accepted in the beloved. God loves every person. Do you believe that? But do you, I know you're saying you believe it, but do you really believe it? That God loves every person. God so loved the world. The world, that's the world of humanity. Not just you know the Tetons or the Alps or Yosemite. Not just the physical. We're talking about humanity. God so loved every person. The most wicked person that we know. We may look at them through human eyes and say, how could God ever love that person? But God may, we, somebody may look at us and say, how could God love him? How could God love her? It's just all about perspective, right? God loves every person. we got to share faith. God loves every person. Every person has been included. Romans says, God demonstrated his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God, Jesus died by faith because I received him 2,000 years later. So in my case, it was by faith that he looked down the corridor of time and he certainly, being the omniscient God, saw the choice that I would make and the choice that everyone makes. But he died for us because we were sinners. And here's another thing. Jesus died on the cross and paid the penalty for all sins. To me, this is going to be one of the tragedies of tragedies that people carried their sin and they didn't give it to Jesus, but they carried it into eternity. Corinthians says this in 514. For the, love of Christ, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus 
that if one, if one died for all, then all died, and he died for all. It's a very personal thing. That the nails in his hand, the nails in his feet, the crown upon his brow, the, the, the spear in his side, and water and blood, blood and water flowed. He did that for you and I. He hung there for us, for my sin. Now, of course, it's only, we don't believe in universalism, but we believe that it's activated and, and experienced by grace through faith when we receive Christ. But I can tell you, his arms are open. You don't have to carry your sin. I think one of the heaviest burdens is guilt. I personally, it's my personal belief, that many people that take medication to try to numb, they don't even know what's driving them. And a lot of it is just the guilt of sin. They don't know how to shake it. They don't know how to get rid of it. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus died for every person. And his blood is for their sin if they'll just receive the blood of Christ. Amen? Amen. And here's another reason we need to share our faith. And that is there's only one way to salvation. And that is through Jesus Christ. There's only one Savior. There's only one saving message, and that's the saving message that we have in the B-I-B-L-E. There are not two saviors. Jesus will have no rival savior. There's no rival savior. There's only one savior, and he is the very son of the living God. He's not Michael, he's not Gabriel, but he is the very son of the living God. His name is Jesus Christ, Matthew 121. His name should be called Jesus And he will save them from their sins. Well, one Savior. And Peter preached. That's what they preached. There's no other name. When Jesus talked to the disciples, he said, I'm the only way. I'm the way. I am the truth, exclusive. The way, the truth, the light. No one comes to the Father except through me. But all can come through Jesus. Why share our faith? We share our faith because we have an example. Listen, we have an example from Jesus. Do you know what, it, you know what his enemies, you know what the great accusation of Jesus was? One of the great accusations. One of the great accusations that the religious people of his day had against Jesus was, he's a friend of sinners. What a crime. Look what it says. Luke 7 says, the son of man, they're accusing him, the son of man came, has come eating and drinking, and you say, look, a glutton and wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Luke 15 says this, the Pharisees and scribes complained and said this, this man receives sinners and he even eats with them. And you have to understand context. These, these folks in this very religious age To even speak to someone like that would be considered like, oh, that's a terrible thing. And yet here Jesus comes and says, you folks have it all wrong. You built up religious walls that nobody can even get to God anymore. And then you throw the key of the word of God away. So the Son of God comes and he sets down with lost people. Now listen, him being a friend of sinners, it doesn't mean he's drinking with them. It doesn't mean he's doing the immoral things. But he is making himself available to them. The salt is there, salting out of the the salt shaker. What a wonderful Savior we have. Here's what Jesus taught. Jesus taught there has to be effort put into winning the lost. Now, just here's a great chapter to read this week at Luke 15, where it talks about three things there. And it's all in the context of these Pharisees complaining that he's a fr- that he's friend of sinners, he's eating with sinners and wine bibbers, he's, he's, he's associating with these people. And what he's doing is trying to reach them. He's trying to save them. And in that chapter, there's three little parables. And there's a parable of the sheep, there's a parable of the silver, the coin, and there's a parable of the sons. And in the, in the first part of that parable, he says, how many of you, to, to logically explain to them what he's doing, he said, how many of you, if you had 100 sheep and, and one was lost, you wouldn't leave the 99 and you'd go out through the crevices and valleys and find that one little sheep. 
Basically says, that's what I'm doing. Then he said, how many of you, if you ladies have 10 coins, which some scholars have said those were coins she received at her wedding. And so to lose one would be like losing your diamond wedding ring. And if she lost one of those coins and she's, she's searching the house, she's sweeping, diligently looking for that one coin. But isn't it interesting in the story that no one ever went and looked for the son. The father longed for him. And maybe, maybe there's something there that I'm not seeing. I certainly don't want to impugn anyone. God gives us a choice. Maybe that's the deal. That if we want to walk away, God, the Lord will let us walk away. He won't force us to be saved. Maybe that's the message there. But isn't it interesting how much we seek earthly things? We'll seek a sheep. We'll seek a coin. But how many are seeking the lost? But when he came back, the father ran to him and embraced him and restored him. And that's what God's doing. That's what God's trying to do with the church. It's not about going to more meetings. It's about equipping us so we can be a part of God's restoring process through the death, real, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God's in the redeeming business, and that's what the business we should be in. Now, isn't it interesting? And I guess the question is this. If Jesus is a friend of sinners, how in the world can the church be an enemy of sinners? Could I ask that again? How, how could we be an enemy of sinners when Jesus, the Son of God, is the friend of sinners? Why should we share our faith? We should share our faith because God loves the world. We should share our faith because evangelism is built into the fabric of this thing. And to not be evangelistic and to not be winning souls is, is to literally not be a fully functioning church. But here's, here's the second question. How do we share our faith? Not just, yeah, we got to share it because of this God's love and God's mercy and the death of Jesus and His blood and His mercy and His willingness to associate with sinners and give us that kind of example. But, Pastor, how do we share our faith? Now, this gets a little bit into attitude. One of the ways we share it is godly devotion. You say, what do you mean? Our witness has to have credibility. I mean, if people are not going to really take us seriously, if, if, if we're living the same kind of lifestyles, I'm not, I'm not talking about some perfection. There's no perfect Christians. We're all striving to be more like the Lord. We're not talking about something that no one can reach, but literally sincerely living a godly, sincere life. If we don't have godly devotion in our life, our witness has no credibility. Peter told the wives that had lost husbands, here's the counsel. Here's what he says. This is 1 Peter 3.1. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they're not saved, they don't follow the Lord. They, without a word, mm, look at that, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. Now think about that. He's, he's, he's not saying don't ever use words. We've got to use words. The gospel is words. The gospel is a message. But I think what he's saying is when that message through that godly wife has credibility, the husband sees her love, sees her tenderness, sees the sincerity. This is a, a wife that has a real relationship with Jesus, and that gives credibility to the witness. How do we witness? Got to have Godly devotion first. It starts there. Not just slinging out a message and throwing out firebrands. We've got to have something to back it up. Can I hear an amen? amen. Now, I share this with you. With no, no judgment, I'm not judging this person. I'm just telling you the story that was brought to me. I had a gentleman say to me many years ago, probably over a decade ago. He said, I work with a lady. She cusses like a sailor. He said, I didn't even know she went to church. Now, there again, I'm not judging her. I'm just telling you what happened. The Lord's her judge. But she said she cussed like a sailor. And I'm not just talking about someone who kind of, in a moment of, of weakness and anger, said something. Go, oh, wow, I shouldn't have said that. We've all done that. This is a woman that cussed like a sailor. He found out she was the head of the children's ministry at her church, cussing like a sailor. I mean, you know that if, if the parents of those children, wouldn't they be incredibly disappointed? There was no godly devotion there. Here's what the Word of God says. Let your light so shine before men that they may see. Everyone say, see. we got to see something before we can say something. Because then when we say something, it has power and weight behind it. 
What's so different about you? They may say at work. I see you. Your, your attitude is different. You're different than we are. Why? Wow, you're a follower of Christ. Godly devotion. Here's, here's something else. Now, this next one may be just as important. It's what I just said. How we share our faith. Godly devotion, but also, listen, deep humility. Deep humility. I believe that sometimes the message is rejected because of the messenger. Not the message. The message is the most beautiful thing the world has ever known. But sometimes messengers can turn folks off. Listen to what Peter said again. Peter said in 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that's in you, with meekness and with fear. This is about how to share the message. I want you to listen to what Warren Wiersbe, the, he's with Jesus now, but listen to what he says about this. And I quote, the witness must, uh, the, this witness must be given with meekness and fear, i.e. respect. Not, not with arrogance and a know-it-all attitude. We are witnesses, not prosecuting attorneys. We must also be sure that our lives back up our defense. Peter did not suggest that Christians argue with lost people, but rather that we present to the unsaved an account of what we believe and why we believe it in a loving manner. The purpose is not to win an argument, but to win a lost soul for Christ, end quote. That's just good right there. I'm telling you, I think sometimes the messenger is what's being rejected, not the message. The message of God's love and God's forgiveness and God's mercy. And yes, people reject the greatest, most respectful, the most meek witness. I understand that. People are going to reject God and do reject God. But I don't want us to be a part of, of why, to give someone an excuse to reject the message. Let's bring the message in humility. If they, if, what if they reject us? What if they lambast us? Keep your heart full of humility and pray for them. And this brings me to the next thing. How we share it. We share it with love and concern. It's not just about theology. It's not just about getting folks in the church or getting a number or a certain number. But this is about truly being concerned for people's lives. Human beings, just like us. Here's, and, and I don't have time to, I mean, all, a lot of this could be sermons in themselves, but just little nuances of scripture that I see. Remember the rich young ruler that came to Jesus? He was seeking, how must I, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said, he gave the, you know, a few commandments, and he said, well, all of these have I done since my youth. I thought, wow, that's a pretty big order there. Wow. <laughs> it's amazing. And then, but Jesus, here's what it said. Look at this. Mark 10, 21. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Jesus didn't say, you rotten sinner. He didn't say, you lying deceiver. You're dece he didn't do that. He looked at him. Can you imagine the, the, the penetrating, the powerful love of God in tangible form? Just gazing at you with no judgment, just love. And he laid out the stipulations. Go, go your way. Sell all that you have. Give to the poor. You have treasure in heaven. Take up your cross and follow me. And we know the young man went away. And probably split, went, went out of eternity without Christ. But notice the love and the concern of Jesus. And I would add one more thing, and that is this. We need to share it with wisdom. We need to have wisdom. Have you seen someone share Christ and it's just such an unwise way? You, it made you cringe. And you know the Lord for decades. And you, it made you cringe by the way they shared Christ. Jesus told us to be very discriminating in the, in the way we share. No, notice what he says in Matthew. Do not give what is holy to the dogs. Nor cast your pearls before swine. The pearls are the gospel. And he says, lest they trample you underfoot, under their feet, and turn and tear you into pieces. Now, John MacArthur in his study Bible has a commentary on this. He says, this verse governs our personal dealings with our enemies. And it's in the context of sharing the gospel. How do we deal with enemies? And he says, this principle governs how we handle the gospel in the face of those who hate the truth. There are times we know that sharing the gospel 
would just bring conflict and it would bring maybe even danger to ourselves. And it would it really bring ju- more judgment on them because they're not going to receive it anyway. So that's how we share our faith. But, but here's something we got to get to, and that's this. What do we share? What do we share about our faith? I mean, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about sharing our faith? Are we talking about, you know, trying to figure out what the third toe on the image that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about? No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the essentials, the very essential message of salvation. Lost people don't care about what's on the third toe of the image that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about. But look at this. Here's the essentials. Pastor, if I'm sharing Christ with someone, what... What do, what do I need to get to? Here, here's the thing you really have to get to. They have to know their need of Christ. You have to show them that they need Christ. They need salvation. And what I want to tell you is this. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, I know some human beings that are very persuasive. I mean, they could almost persuade lost people to get saved when they don't even want to be saved. But they're probably still lost. Because salvation is a work of the Holy Spirit. Certainly we cooperate with Him in this witness. But we have the Holy Spirit, uh, uh, John 16, 8, he, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. Then it says He will convict of what? Sin and righteousness and judgment to come. It's the Holy Spirit that works in a person's life. And yes, He can work through our witness but if someone doesn't know they need, it's like the guy who knocked on the door one time and, and he was, sh- was sharing Christ in the neighborhood and the, and the guy was really serious. He says, oh, you know, he said, I want to share Christ with you and you need to be saved and all of this. And, and the guy was just totally serious. He says, he, you know, of course he was looking at it in a carnal way. He's like, you know, I don't, I don't think I really need Jesus. He said, you know, man, I, I feel good. I'm healthy. I, I've got uh, marriage is good. And. He's like, I mean, he's like, this is lost. I got a boat, you know, I'm pretty happy here. I, you know, he was like totally serious. This guy didn't have any concept of eternity or anything. I mean, in that case, you, you, you have to pray that the Spirit of God would awaken their hearts. And he, that's what he does. You also need to not only show them their need quickly, but also show them the consequences of rejecting Christ. Now, this is where it gets a little harder. This is, this is a message that is completely impalatable for today. It's, it's, it's a message you very rarely even hear preachers preach anymore. That there are consequences in eternity. And as hard and as much as our world doesn't want to hear that in the love of God, we must tell them that there is an eternity out there. And the most horrible thing that could happen to a human being is to die without Jesus. I don't think there's any preacher, no matter how much of a wordsmith they are, that they could clearly articulate the horrors of a crisis eternity. It's a hard message. But we must share that there are consequences. We share it in love. We share it in humility. We share it in meekness. But, oh, brothers and sisters, we must share it if we are gospel people. We also must show them the bliss of knowing Christ. Now, I have a little caveat here. If you're a miserable Christian, (laughs) let me just shoot straight with you. If you're a miserable person, if you're always complaining about everything, and if you're the negative Nancy, I don't think we have a Nancy here. I hope we don't. That was just for illustrative purposes. (laughs) But if you're just a miserable person, please don't tell me about the joy of salvation. They're going to go... Is that what Jesus does to you? No, I don't think so. I get more out of my Budweiser, you know. But there is a joy to knowing Jesus. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Salvation is, we draw it from the wells of salvation with with joy. Paul gave up everything and said, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. It's wonderful to know Jesus. Let people see the joy of serving the Lord. Powerful witness. And you got to show them the way of salvation. People think all kind of crazy stuff. Burning candles. Believe in weird doctrines. Some people say, well, you, some people, you can never know. You just can never know. It's like the you know, luck of the draw or something. No, no. You have to show them that salvation, the way of salvation, is the way of grace through faith. Not of works. 
See, you can't earn your salvation. Salvation is not on merit demerit kind of system. Salvation is by grace. It's, it's not of works. It's by grace. You can't earn it. That's why it's a gift from God. That's why it's grace. You can't earn it. It can only be received. You have to show them that. Because so many people, they want a comparison. Do you think you're going to heaven? They're going to say, well, I'm a pretty good person. Well, compared to what? See, that's the way human beings think. We have this pride of trying to, you know, feel like we're better than the next person. But no, we need salvation. And the way is by grace. It's God's love. It's received by grace through faith. And what I would ask you also is not only show them the way of salvation, show them the passage. You have to show them what the Word of God says in Romans, that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and we believe in our heart that God is raised from the dead, you will be saved. For with, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. When we share the message of the gospel, it's designed, God has designed his word to put faith in a person when they hear about the death, the burial, and the resurrection. When they hear about the love of God. When they hear about what God has done through Christ. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing about by the word of God. And that particularly is the message about salvation will impart faith to that person. Romans 8, 9, and 10 and 17 is a great place to start. Proclaim Christ. Share Christ with them. Not the church. Not some, but share God's love with them. And the last thing I would say in closing is this. When, when do we share? Why do we share? How do we share? With whom do we share? What's, what kind of message do we share? But when do we share it? And this last little thought should do something in every one of our hearts. And that's this. Jesus said time was of the essence. When he was in John 4 and he had spoken to the lady, she went back in the city and she brings out the city and they come in the multitudes. Jesus said this, do not say this. Do not say there are four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields for they are already white for harvest. Time is of the essence. We can't share the gospel with someone that's in a grave or in eternity. We must share Jesus with them now. Why? Time is of the essence. Paul, through the Holy Spirit, reiterated this. He said, in an acceptable time, I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now. Everyone say now. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. I want you to stand with me. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about someone who is lost right now. We all know lost people. I want you to just think a moment. Just don't think about anything else. Just think about that. Maybe it's, maybe it's a co-worker that you're, that's your friend. Maybe it's someone who's turned their back on the Lord. Maybe it's a family member, aunt, uncle. Maybe it's your mom or dad. Maybe it's a brother or sister, some sibling. But we're all around lost people. And I think sometimes Christians are maybe a little intimidated by lost people. But let me just remind you that you're not the Savior. You can't save anyone. Only Jesus can save them. But we have a responsibility, and that responsibility is to speak to them 
and, and to pray for them. Paul really is just an amazing minister of the gospel. He carried such a deep burden for Israel. He said, this, my, my heart's cry, he said, I'm paraphrasing, my, my heart cry, my heart cries out. He said, if I thought that I could be cut off from Christ, if that meant that, that all of Israel could be saved, I would do it. He carried that kind of burden. And so I want you just to think a moment about your family. I think that's where we should be. What about your children, precious teenagers today? Growing up with stuff that's going on now, oh, how we need to get the gospel of the teenagers, how we need to get the gospel of these boys and girls and get it deeply in them. That's why we, thank God we raised, Lord helped us raise the money to get these boys and girls to camp. That's where I was at the camp. I spent the night down there. It's an amazing camp. And we're going to get our teenagers there too. But I think what we need to do, I think as we close this meeting, there needs to be a quiet time of prayer for lost people. Write them down. Write them down on a prayer sheet and stick it in your Bible and pray for them every chance that God reminds you. You don't want your loved ones to die lost. You don't want anyone to die lost. Jesus is a friend of sinners. You, listen, I'm not going to go to the bar and sit around, and, and but, but I want to be in contact with lost people. Lost people are not our enemies. Satan is the enemy. I don't have a beef personally with any and all this cra- the most craziest stuff going on. But they need Jesus. They need Jesus. So I want you right now just to bow your heads. And I want you just to begin to pray quietly for that, that person that's on your mind. It may be a dad. It may be a mom. Father, we ask that salvation, the spirit of the living God, would begin to be poured out on our lost loved ones. Lord, our lost friends. Lord, names are being called right now, quietly being whispered. Touch John, touch Susie, touch Tim, touch this one, touch that one. Lord, I want you to hear every prayer that's prayed right now. I pray that deep and holy conviction would fall on our lost loved ones, our friends, our co-workers. Lord, I pray that the power of sin would begin to be broken. That you'd begin, oh God, to awaken hearts to the need of Christ. I pray that, Lord. I pray that we would all walk out of this place today knowing that we are competent, capable, effective witnesses for Jesus. It's not complicated. Lord, I pray that we would be good on the essentials, that we'd be excellent with knowing that it's, it's God's love through Jesus. It's by grace through faith, not of works. It is by confession. It's by trust and faith in Jesus that we can be saved. And so, Lord, I pray over the next 12 months that there would be an incredible harvest of souls. Lord, I pray that you would help let the lost feel our love. Lord, as we, as we share the message, let us not do it with arrogance and know-it-all spirit and, and, and a prideful pushiness. But, Lord, give us spirits that are tender and meek and compassionate as we share. Lord, that it would fall on soil that's just hungry Some are going to be lost through pleasure. Some are lost in drugs. They're on the party scene. They're in immorality. They're in deception. They're in perversion. But, Lord, they're just reaching for the next thing. And, Lord, I pray that you would strategically, strategically place our church family in those moments when we can plant the seed of the gospel. And I pray for salvations. I pray for multitudes to be saved. Lord, as we get this church up, that multitudes would come, that we would reach them and have an incredible harvest before the coming of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now I want you to lift your hands. I want to pray that God would fill you. Father, I pray you'd fill every one of us with power. Power that we can be effective witnesses. We can't do it in our own human persuasion. All we're going to do is persuade a sinner to just be a bigger sinner. But Lord, when we're anointed and the Spirit of God does the convicting work, That person's heart is changed. Their heart is ready. Their mind is ready. And so, Lord, I pray that that you would fill every one of us with power and that we would be your witnesses. That we would be your witnesses, oh God. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' great name. In Jesus' great name. So here's our assignment this week. 
that is in the love and in the naturalness of your own personality, just naturalness. I'm praying that God would open up doors and you're going to see opportunities and moments and strategic moments where you're able just to plant the love of God. And for others, it may be a a more strategic witness, maybe an extensive witness, but we're like farmers. We're sowing seeds. We're sowing seeds. And I'm believing God's going to do that in each of our lives. Do you believe that? It's going to happen. Father, today I pray the blessing of the Lord on this body. Hallelujah. And I pray the blessing on you of where our church name, new church name came from. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And everyone shouted, I love you, church. God bless you today as you're dismissed.